Hey, church family, this weekend, we are wrapping up a series called It Is Written. As a church, we have been trying to have some really honest conversations about how we can identify and find victory in our lives over temptation. And it can be hard to have these discussions. It's hard sometimes to pull back the curtain and allow each other to see some of the struggles that we're dealing with. But this is a safe place for us to do it. We all struggle, we're all tempted, um, and the Bible would teach us that we are to help each other on this journey. I am really excited that you're gonna get to hear from a pastor today who has helped me on this journey as much as any pastor. The title of his sermon that he's gonna be preaching is called A Chord of Three Strands. It comes from a passage in the Old Te Testament that says a chord of three strands is not easily broken. And in that passage, it talks about if one person falls down, it, another person is there to pick him up and how important that is. And so I'm thrilled that the preacher you're gonna to get to hear from today is a preacher who has done that for me, a preacher that I've had the privilege to do that for. We've done this for each other over the years uh, for a long time and have helped each other, encouraged each other, held each other accountable, challenged each other, um, been honest with, with each other when we've struggled. Um, and so I'm really excited that he's gonna be the one to challenge you in this area you know him well. Would you please welcome former senior pastor, Dave Stone. Thank you all. Hello, thank you. That's really kind of y'all, thank you. You all are nice. Well, uh, a welcome to every one of our campuses, and uh, I, I want you to know I am so glad that you are here because I almost wasn't here. I uh, got to church about an hour and 10 minutes before the service started, and I was sitting in my car, and I was practicing my sermon out loud, and I, I got about halfway through, and I realized that something was, was wrong. I couldn't figure out what it was, and I guess it was about 40 minutes before the sermon was supposed to start that uh, I realized that I had forgotten something. So I called the tech people and said, hey, I, I hope to be there right as the service starts. So I had to run home. So I'll let you get two guesses here. Uh, how many of you all think I forgot my Bible? Okay. How many of you all think I forgot my sermon? <laughs> well, it's neither one of those. I, I actually forgot my teeth. Uh, yeah, uh, you know you're getting old when uh, I gotta get back and get my teeth. Uh, but I had some dental surgery done a couple months ago and they, they took out two of my front teeth. And so I have to wear something in there so that you think I've got front teeth, okay? And uh, when I looked in that rear view mirror, I realized this is not gonna go well, you know? <laughs> Somebody's gonna be flipping through on the internet and say, yeah, that's a Kentucky preacher right there. <laughs> so I got my teeth, I'm ready for action now. That's, that's embarrassing. Uh, we've been in a series talking about temptation and, and temptation is all around us. I, I love the fact that this, that this passage that we're gonna look at today talks about how we need one another. The series title, It Is Written, reminds us of the simple fact that Jesus constantly went one direction whenever he was tempted. He beat a path to God's word. And that's what we wanna be able to do. But there's an additional way that can help us not give in to temptation. And it's, it's literally all around you. It's right here. It's the church. It's one another. We need each other, we, we were made to grow with one another, and as we face trials of many kinds, a community of believers can help us stand firm. And as our nation begins to emerge from this pandemic and, and return to some type of normalcy, now more than ever is the time for us to experience the value of the church, the body of Christ, the value of one another. And the result is that it will, will help us overcome temptation. Now, the book of Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon near the end of his life, and it is essentially his final reflections on a life that was filled with every kind of temptation and sin. 
So at the end of Solomon's life, as he looks back, there is incredible wisdom that we can glean from this book, uh, all surrounding temptation. And a lot of that has to do with who you surround yourself with. That's why you've heard us say countless times, show us your friends, I'll show you your future. And that's true. So today I wanna talk about two words that can make you more prone to falling into temptation. And the first word is that of isolation. Now isolation is something that's been on the rise in recent months. Solomon has something to say about it in our text that Kyle alluded to in Ecclesiastes chapter four. We'll begin with verses nine and 10. Two people are better off than one for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Now that phrase, better off than, was, was a common phrase that was used in wisdom literature uh, throughout the Bible. It's a way of comparing different ways to live. That's still common today. A parent might say that to, to their kids. They'll say, well, you can do this or you can do that. And they say it in such an obvious way that, that the choice is a simple choice. It's because they wanna make certain that you make the right choice. Now, two are better than one, as Solomon says. Think back when you were a kid and you went to camp. You'd be at summer camp and they'd start to swim in the lake or in the pool and beforehand you had to match up with the buddy system. What was the value of that? Well, you had a buddy that was right there beside you and so that security, those checks and balances allowed you to have more fun and less stress. Because there was a friend beside you, there was, there was someone to help. And Solomon is just saying what all kinds of contemporary research has now confirmed. We are better together than being alone. So when Solomon says two are better than one, he is talking about the value that comes in community. We flourish when we're connected with others and we fall when we are not. And you know that to be true. We've seen this time and time again. And Solomon should know better than anyone that temptation is fueled in isolation. And giving in to temptation of any kind weakens you and gradually pulls you away from the very people that you need. And we've talked so much about temptation because it can lead to sin and sin leads to a life that is not God's best for you. And you were made by God's design to live at your best in community. You were created in the image of God and God is a community within himself. God the Father. God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And he is an example of how community can live in complete unity, even with our distinct gifts and roles. That's why inside each one of us there is this relational DNA, an inner desire to connect with others. It is instinctive, it is inherent within us. Why? Well, I said it earlier, because you were made in his image. All three parts of the Godhead were there at the creation of the world. That's why in Genesis chapter one, verse 26, it says, let us make mankind in our own image. It doesn't say, let me make mankind in my own image. So all three of the Godhead are there. And you know that life is better when there are others there beside you. Friendships, mentors, other relationships. On the first day at a new school, it's far better to have a friend in the lunchroom. When you enter into the hospital, it's a lot easier if there's somebody there beside you. When you walk into the courtroom, it's better not to go alone. And the Journal of the Medical, American Medical Association discovered that when it comes to fighting the common cold, that those with strong emotional connections did four times better fighting off illness than those who were isolated. And there's a whole body of research that shows that people who have strong support systems are much healthier than those who don't. In fact, I hesitate to even say this to you, but here it goes. People who have had bad health habits but have strong social ties live longer than people who have great health habits but are isolated. In other words, it's better to eat fudge brownies with your friends than to eat broccoli by yourself, okay? <laughs> That's right, good. That's the that's first amen I got. Uh, <laughs> Harvard Medical School professor Jacqueline Olds makes this pertinent observation. 
America is in the midst of a loneliness epidemic and the isolation is undermining our health. Our seeming obsession with the most intimate details of strangers' lives as evidenced by the exponential rise of reality shows is another manifestation of our isolation. When you lack a circle of people that you know well, talking and gossiping about strangers is a way to fill the gap. But it is a pseudo community. It is not a real community. If, if you spend your time talking as if you were with the Kardashians at the Memorial Day cookout, then you probably need to, to get out a little bit more with people. But the church should be different. The church should be so distinctive. The church should be an honest, genuine, interactive, life-giving community. Two are better off than one. We know that. God designed us to be with others. So here's the progression that needs to occur. Isolation must progress toward interaction with one another. You might not want that, but you need it. And for some of you, you need it now more than ever. Isolation is one of Satan's strongest weapons in his arsenal of evil. And in the last year in this season of separation, COVID has made it easier for Satan to isolate us from one another. And we've seen how it is that that has affected us. But we need one another. We need to stand together and have one another's back. So here's the other word that can cause problems for us. And that is the word independence. Now, don't misunderstand me. It's it's not a bad word. It only becomes bad if we OD on that and we make such a a big deal about it that everything revolves around that. It's the battle cry of the toddler. I can do it myself. And maybe you can do it yourself, but you're going to miss out on a whole lot of fun of having people beside you. You see, people, when they pull away from church, At times, it's because they want more independence. Maybe they have repeatedly been giving in to temptation, so they feel more uncomfortable when they're in church, so they just begin to pull away. Maybe it's an 18-year-old that goes off to college, and they don't have their mom and dad to make certain that they go to church, and so they just begin to pull away. I like the way uh, Andy Stanley puts it after 40 years of ministry. He says, people usually drift away from their community of faith before they drift away from faith. And Satan succeeds at deceiving us into thinking that we are better off alone. I don't need anyone else. I'm totally independent. I'm doing quite fine on my own. I don't need the church. And they keep the spotlight on themselves because they are proud of their independence. And what typically happens when you OD on independence is you begin to look at life through a different lens and and everything begins to revolve around you. And over time you withdraw until you are isolated in your own little world where you can call the shots. Some of you will remember a Hall of Fame baseball player by the name of, of Reggie Jackson. He played for the Oakland A's, the New York Yankees. He finished his career with the Baltimore Orioles. And the Orioles manager was a guy by the name of Earl Weaver. And Earl Weaver had one rule, and that was that you could not try to steal a base without getting the steal sign from him in the dugout. Well, of course, this was an affront to a temperamental ego like Reggie Jackson. And one time he was at at first base, and he took his lead. And as the pitch was delivered, he took off for second base. He slid in, and he barely beat the tag. As he got up, he just kind of brushed his his uniform off and looked right at Earl Weaver in the dugout and just kind of glared at him, proud of his accomplishment. But after the game was over, Earl Weaver pulled him aside and said, Reggie, he said, I want to talk to you. I want to tell you why I didn't give you the steal sign. He said, when you stole second, that left first base open. He said, our second best power hitter on the team next to you is Lee May, and he was at the plate. Because first base was open, they intentionally walked Lee May. The next batter that was coming up had not had hardly any success against that pitcher. And so I was forced to to put in a pinch hitter for him. That left me with insufficient bench strength should the game go into extra innings, which it did, and I think that's why we lost the game. Do you see the difference? 
Reggie Jackson wanted to steal a base. Earl Weaver wanted to win a ball game. And sometimes we can become so focused on advancing our own personal agenda that we lose sight of the others around us. And when we do that, we forget what a win really is. You see, independence must progress toward interdependence, where we depend on God, where we depend on others. Can I remind you of the mission of Southeast? Connect people to Jesus and one another. That's why you're going to invite people to come with you next week to the At The Movies series. When you connect with others, the likelihood of them connecting to Jesus increases. Let's look at the rest of Ecclesiastes chapter four at this passage. We pick it back up, verses 10 through 12. If one person falls, the other one can reach out and help, but someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm, but how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Three strands woven together means that they are in sync and they are vulnerable to one another. It means they are dependent on each other. One cord can't go off and do its own thing. It means that they're wrapping their lives around similar things. Their lives are on mission. A true threefold relationship is one in which each strand works together for a divine purpose. There is no separation. There is no self agenda. Three people are better than two. Two people are better than one in withstanding an enticing temptation. When our girls were little, I, I used to watch Beth uh, braid their hair. Uh, for some reason, they never asked me to, uh, to do that. But my wife tells me that it takes the third strand to, to hold it together. Without that third strand, it begins to unravel. Did you know that a, a three-stranded rope is stronger than one with four or five strands? Here's why. It's because with three strands, each part is constantly in contact with the other two, forming the strongest and the tightest bond possible. You have probably had some three-strand experiences. Maybe it's a friendship with another Christian. Kyle and I were texting on Thursday, uh, just saying how fortunate we, we both have been to have that type of a relationship and friendship together. And God is the third strand. You see it in a healthy marriage. You see it in a business partnership among Christians because you are allowing God to be involved in every part and touch all aspects and segments. In December, I shared with you in a sermon that it had been a tough stretch for our family that we'd gone through for the past uh, six months. And we were very excited about 2021 arriving, but 2021 picked up right where 2020 left off for us. And the hits just kept on coming. And I went through a stretch in February and March where I really didn't want to be around people. And you know, that's not like me. And numerous life circumstances were just weighing me down and the joy that had characterized my life for years seemed to be replaced by a heaviness from what just continued to be a monthly barrage of different things. And at the end of April, I, I started seeing a counselor. And I've never done that in my life. And the fact that I wrestled with telling you that, of seeing a counselor probably reveals that I'm also wrestling with pride. And I would like for you to think that I've got it all together, but I don't. And in this season, in this last year, God has been teaching me so much. He has been teaching me to run to him, to see him as my refuge, to see him as my shelter, as my fortress. And yet it's been a time when I, I just wanted to hole up in my home and, and just isolate myself. But when I was at my lowest, a good friend who didn't know the specifics of my situation, he texted me and he asked me to join his men's group. 
And everything within me wanted to say no. But I, I prayed about it and I said yes, even though I didn't want to do it. And from week one, they just welcomed me into that group and it was exactly what I needed because when you get into community with others, you realize you're not alone. That there are others who have been where you are right now. And there is hope. And what I'm saying is Christ in the Christian community can help you. And sometimes to heal, you have to make yourself do something that you don't want to do. And those times when you prefer to withdraw from your Christian friends, that's probably the time when you need them the most. So live your life as an open book, warts and all, missing teeth and all. Pursue community with others. We are all working on areas in our life. Some God has helped us to conquer. Others we continue to battle. We all have strengths and weaknesses. Some we can control, some, some are out of our control. We have no say in them. Sometimes when I speak at a conference or at a banquet, an administrative assistant from that place will contact me and they'll say, you know, uh, what's your travel information? What are your food preferences? Uh, what's your hotel preference? And do you have any food allergies? And a few years ago, I discovered that I uh, was lactose intolerant, which basically means that you can't eat any of your favorite foods, all right? <laughs> Even if you have your teeth in. Uh, <laughs> But I've also discovered that the news of my dairy allergy rarely gets passed on to the food people. I don't know why, but they just, they take the information, but they don't pass it on. So when I get to a luncheon or dinner, I mean, they come and they serve me, you know, macaroni and cheese and a glass of whole milk and buttermilk pie with a scoop of ice cream beside, you know, something that might be an exaggeration. All right. But there was one exception. It was an event in Nashville. It was a dinner with about 70 people. And the host had brought in a Grammy Award winner to have a private concert for us after dinner. And he was seated at a different table about eight feet from us. And the lady in charge of the meal was helping the servers deliver the entrees. And just after a young gal placed a plate down in front of me, the lady in charge from the other side of the table began yelling, no, 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 he doesn't get that. He's lactose intolerant. Half the room heard what she said, all right? I mean, it was, it was terrible. People are looking at me. I could tell there was something different about him. <laughs> well, my face immediately turns bright red. Everyone is now gawking at me. Men, women, Grammy Award winners. <clears throat> They're all just looking at me. And so I was embarrassed and at my own table. The people on either side of me took their chairs and scooted. <laughs> a couple of inches away from me. One of them was my wife. <laughs> now we all have our own weaknesses and struggles that we prefer to keep quiet and private and some we can't change. Our struggles go much deeper though than our stomach. Our struggles can be found in our heart. But if we're not careful, we can become more consumed with protecting our image rather than building his kingdom. If you want to act like you're perfect and don't have a struggle, you can do that. But I'm just telling you, nobody's believing it. Nobody's buying it. So instead, help your own spiritual and emotional health by seeking authentic community and confessing it. Alcoholics Anonymous has a motto. They say, you're only as sick as your secrets. The Apostle Paul had some ongoing struggle. It's called a thorn in the flesh that he prayed for God to remove. Most people think that it was some type of physical ailment or affliction. And so what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, he says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When you feel self-conscious over some physical imperfection, when you feel inadequate in some way, when you begin to open up about your weaknesses and give them to God, that's when he does his best work. I love the way Lecrae says, he says, I'm not a Christian because I'm strong and have it all together. I'm a Christian because I'm weak and I need a savior. 
So when you confess sin, when you admit weakness, you are crucifying pride. You are inviting God to come in and do a work in your life. God won't heal what you don't reveal. And when you share struggles with a Christian brother or sister, you are inviting cleansing and you're showing your dependence on God and your interdependence on others. I'm thinking of a a time several years ago, a number of years ago, our, our elders were asked to do an anointing with a godly young woman in our church who was battling a terminal illness. The Bible says in James chapter five, verse 14, is any among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and to anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And that's what she had done. And we were packed in a room and an elder said, can we pray for you? And we started to gather around her and she said very humbly, she said, well, before that, can, can I read what the next verse in that paragraph says? In James chapter five, verse 16. And she began to quote and say, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. But look at that first part. And this gal said to us, she said, before you pray and anoint me, I need to confess some sins to you all. And as elders, we had never heard anyone say this in the middle of an anointing. And she went on to say, I haven't always been respectful of the elders. I haven't always agreed with the decisions made by the church leaders and the elders. And at times I haven't had the best attitude about that. And then she said, and today I repent of that and I ask for your forgiveness. None of us will ever forget that day. Her humility, her honesty, her obedience, it touched us. And in that moment, as the elders began to pray for her, I don't think we had ever felt such a sense of closeness to someone that we were anointing. Confession and vulnerability has a way of deepening community. Confession is therapeutic in the sense that it's good for your soul. We don't heal in isolation. We heal in community through honesty and accountability. But our typical response is, well, tell me how to experience healing, but don't muddy the water by asking me to confess my sins. Don't tell me about God's grace, but I'd rather not know about, tell me about God's grace, but I'd rather not know about his wrath. Tell me about God's provision, but don't talk to me about tithing. Tell me about God's mercy, but don't expect me to forgive someone. In the years to come, life is going to become much more difficult for Christians. Our culture is dramatically and drastically changing. And so I'm telling you, we're gonna need each other. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. What's the day? The day of Christ's return. Look, you're gonna have seasons of struggle and suffering, and during those times, you're gonna be more open to temptation, so that's why you have to lean in with Christian friends so that the church can be the church to you. And if you're not involved in a small group, I just wanna encourage you to, to be involved. That becomes a smaller church within a church to you. And all you have to do, if you wanna get information about that, any, any of our campuses, you just have to text the word groups to 733-733. We are stronger together. Two are better than one. Three is better than two. When I preached that last time at Southeast in in December of last year, after that service, my son and I got in a car and we drove up to Cincinnati to talk to my 84-year-old dad about moving him into a memory care unit due to his dementia. And that was a really difficult day. That was a really difficult meeting. And one month later, my dad passed away from cardiac failure. And because of COVID, we we had to wait a while to have the service, which we we finally had just last Thursday. And one of the employees, her name is Hannah, who helped dad move to the memory care unit, drove an hour to be at the service. This 17-year-old had helped us in so many ways during dad's last month. And after the funeral, I learned that, that Hannah had written an essay all about my dad for her class at school. 
And I just got a copy of it. I just, just found this out a few days ago. And I asked for a copy of it. And with her permission, let me read some of it to you. December 21st, my boss asked me to come in early and help move a resident that I knew from the apartments to memory care. Sam was moving, but due to COVID restrictions, I had I'd never met his family. I had never moved a resident before nor met their family. And initially I walked into his room, my hands were sweating, but as soon as I started talking to the family, we clicked. And after the long morning, they even included me in their family prayer time with Sam. They told me that I felt like part of the family. And since they hadn't seen Sam's face during COVID, I mentioned to them that I could FaceTime them occasionally so that they could see him. And on Christmas Eve, I walked into Sam's new room and with only seeing my face, a subtle grin appeared across his. I showed him my phone and he became ecstatic. It was his son and daughter-in-law. His face lit up like the sun. He was foreign to FaceTime. Since it was Christmas Eve, this was huge to him and this was huge to his family. I began visiting Sam at the end of almost all of my shifts. I didn't know that until I read this. We would go through his pictures, which helped his memory from deteriorating as quickly. He wasn't the only one benefiting from our talks. I was too. He was so wise, a walking Bible encyclopedia. I learned a lot from him. He was a pastor, therefore we could relate to God in a lot of ways. When he asked how my day was, I, I could feel he actually cared. When he asked for my help, I could feel he trusted me as I did him. Sam was the strongest male figure in my life. He was getting more sick, but he shone through the darkness. And every time he would see me in the hallway, he would smile. He had a fall one morning and another fall a few days later, which sent him to the hospital. And that afternoon, he died in the hospital due to cardiac failure. A beautiful life complete. A man I was so blessed to meet. God put him on this earth to change lives. Sam achieved his pur purpose. <laughs> Sam and his family have helped me more than they will ever know. I would visit Sam for not only his benefit, but my own. To Sam, I was an angel on earth sent to him. But to me, Sam was an angel on earth sent to me. Honestly, I, I don't know whether this essay <laughs> is about how dad ministered to Hannah or how Hannah ministered to dad. Take your pick. But here's what I do know. Two are better than one. And three are better than two. And when you feel too young and too inexperienced at something in your workplace or life, God may be using your servant's heart to brighten the lives of others. And when you feel too old, like you're ready to go and be with Jesus and be reunited with your wife of 56 years, don't isolate yourself. You can still take an interest in others. You can still smile at people in the hallway. You can still encourage because even as an elderly, elderly man with dementia, God may still use you to be the strongest role model in the teenager's life. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, we are not Christians because we are strong. We are Christians because we are weak. Would you show us how we are stronger together and how our Christian friendships can help us to resist temptation? Would you deliver us from evil? And may our isolation give way to interaction. May our independence progress toward interdependence and remind us along the way that when we are weak, then we are strong. In Jesus' name, amen.